In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. For our meditation today in this time of prayer with our Lord Jesus Christ, we can put ourselves in the scene of this Sunday's Gospel. It's a scene that's familiar to us. It's one of the accounts of the multiplication of the loaves and fish. It's a miracle that our Lord did several times. And this account comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 6. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Lord, we put ourselves in this crowd, this crowd that's come from all over, all over Israel, all over Judea, to be close to you, having seen and heard about these wonderful miracles, how many people you've helped. And each one of us, Lord, comes with our own problems, our own concerns, our own petitions for your help. And we approach you and we want to see what you're like and see what you'll do for us and do for the crowd. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Lord Jesus, you test Philip with this question. And I guess the right answer is nowhere. Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? And given that they are in the wilderness there, up up on this mountain, the answer is nowhere. We can't, there's nowhere to buy bread for this crowd. Philip's answer, I don't know if he got an A or a B plus or something like that on this test, is a pretty good answer. Philip answered him, six months wages would not be enough bread for each one of them to get a little. We don't have the money for this. How, how could we ever buy bread for these people? Jesus asks, where can we buy it? And Philip says, well, even if there were a place, right, there's not, <laughs> there's not enough money to buy it. And Jesus is doing this to test him, to see if he would come up with an even better answer. Lord, we don't have the means, there's no bread and there's no money, but you could do something. Right? That would be the A+. Plus. Lord, we don't need to buy bread. You could provide it. You could use your power to help this crowd. He said this to test him. And that's an important thing in our life, in our life of faith. Our Lord, at certain times of our life, tests us. He tests our faith. He tests our vocation. He tests our fidelity. The word for temptation in the Bible also means a testing. And temptation is precisely a test, any kind of temptation. We could also view it as a chance to prove our love a chance to test ourselves for for God, to see if we're growing, and a chance, in fact, to grow, to grow in faith, to grow in some virtue. And I think it's a helpful, positive spin to put on any difficulty, any trial or temptation. This is a test. This is an opportunity to prove something to our Lord. This is an opportunity to earn a good grade, to, to be pleasing to him, by coming through this test well, by resisting the temptation or seeing it as an opportunity to grow in some virtue, to grow in loyalty or to grow in faith. And faith, of course, is trust. And so when we're tested, when we're tempted, one of the great reactions of the soul is to trust more in our Lord. We might feel weak. We might feel like we We'll be overwhelmed by the temptation. We might not feel up for the challenge or the trial that's before us. But God is all-powerful. And he can help us do things that 
we simply have absolutely no ability to do on our own. And this is what he's doing here at this miracle. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? And so Andrew, in a way, is testing our Lord back. And well, we've got we've got five loaves and two fish, but I don't think that's enough. <laughs> right, Jesus asked Philip, where can we buy bread for this crowd? Where can we buy food for this crowd? And Philip says, we don't have enough money. And Andrew says, well, we got some stuff here. Is, is it enough, Lord? What can we do with this? And so the apostles are in a situation where Jesus is asking them for something that they have absolutely no power to do. And so what's the solution? The solution is to, is to turn around and just tell Jesus, look, this is what we have. This is what we can do. And if, and if you want us to do this thing that is way beyond these resources, well, then you're going to have to help us. You're going to have to make up the difference between what needs to be done, what you're asking, and my meager resources to get it done on my own. And that's living with faith. That's acting with faith. Doing everything we can, everything possible humanly, to do what God wants us to do, to handle the problems in front of us, to get through those tests. At the same time, with this great spirit of relying on our Lord's help, relying on His power, and not and not on our own power. St. Josemaria once had a powerful experience that speaks to this kind of trust, this situation. St. Josemaria was in London, in the very beginning of Opus Dei there in England, and he was walking through the financial district of London, and he was contemplating the powerful institutions, the banks and other financial institutions in the city, and he felt kind of overwhelmed and powerless, thinking about how much money and how much power, how much prestige and tradition was in that industry in London. And the thought came to him, what can I do? I can't do anything to change this or to sanctify it or help these people. And he heard a locution, a message from God in his soul. He heard the words, you can't, but I can. You can't, but I can. So, Lord Jesus, when I come up against these tests in my faith, these tests to my vocation, tests to my fidelity, temptations that try to pull me away from you, and I feel weak, help me to remember this, that perhaps I can't on my own, but with you, Lord, with you, Lord, I can. With your help, I can do anything. I can do anything God wants me to do. In a way, it's like Peter walking on the water when Jesus passes by that boat and they're afraid, they're not sure if it's him. And he says, fear not, it is I. Peter says to him in the midst of that storm, Lord, if it is you, command me to walk out on the water to you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter starts walking on water. It's a, doing something totally impossible for him to do. Without ceasing to be Peter, and the water doesn't cease to be water, because he's trusting our Lord, because he's looking at our Lord, because he's doing it with trust, he ends up doing something that's absolutely beyond any human ability, any human resources he has. Walking on water towards our Lord Jesus Christ. This is faith. Right? Peter has to take the steps. Peter has to decide to try to do what God wants him to do. But he ends up doing it, walking on water, only because he's doing it out of trust in Jesus. And then the, the passage tells us he sees the wind and he immediately is afraid and starts to sink. When he takes his eyes off of our Lord, when he stops living in trust, well, then immediately he can't do those things that are beyond his power. He sinks back to his human level. And then he cries out, Lord, save. And Jesus 
after Peter cries out, Lord, save, help. Jesus grabs him and they end up back in the boat. In each one of our lives, perhaps every day, right? perhaps for long protracted periods, there's going to be something like this going on. Our Lord's going to be asking us to do something that maybe we're afraid of doing or to do something that we really don't like to do. We're not naturally excited about it. Perhaps to get along or forgive someone who we find we find difficult. To do something perhaps at work that we're not too confident that we're good at and we're worried how it's going to come off. But we know that we should and it's the next step in our career. It's just part of our duties. But all of this is, is in a way an opportunity for us to throw ourselves into it, to try our best and to count on God to make up the difference. Lord, if you want me to do this, you can help me do it. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to give you everything I have. And you have to make up the difference. This is what they do in this this passage. They take this boy's loaves and fish and they give it to our Lord. There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. The gospel doesn't tell us about this boy's attitude. Did he willingly give up his food? Or did he have to be coaxed into it? I like to imagine him as a kind of a chubby little kid. And he's the only one who who brought his lunch out of that whole crowd. And that Andrew and perhaps Peter have to kind of of, um, stiff arm him into giving giving up his food right maybe they put him in a headlock they're giving him a little bit of a of a noogie saying come on give us that lunch give us that lunch and so finally the poor boy gives in and he becomes part of history part of the gospel and we could be like that too sometimes our first reaction is is not to be generous with god not to trust him to want to hang on to our lunch so to speak to want to retain control, even though it's a small thing compared to what God can do with our lives and our will and our heart if we give it to him. Lord, help us to be like this boy who eventually gives up what he has, gives up control, gives up his resources so that you can do something greater with it. So that you can take it and feed the whole crowd with it. And there's a crowd of people in my life. I might not know them all yet. I might not see them all. There's a crowd of people in my life waiting to be fed by my correspondence with you, Lord. They're waiting for me to take what I have and hand it over to you so that you can multiply it. But I have to hand it over to our Lord with trust, with faith. We have to do our part. We have to give that lunch. We have to, like Peter, take that step. And faith is portrayed as a very powerful force in the gospel. It unlocks the power of God. The angel Gabriel tells Mary, With God all things are possible. And when she wonders, How can I be a virgin and a mother? How can this be since I don't know man? And the angel Gabriel says, With God all things are possible. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Elizabeth is pregnant in her old age. With God, all things are possible. And Mary puts her faith in that truth. With God, all things are possible. And she says, be done unto me according to your word. Jesus tells that father of the the possessed boy, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man says, I believe, help my unbelief. All things are possible to him who believes. 
St. Paul, speaking from his own personal experience, says, I can do all things in him who strengthens me. What great testaments to faith. These words of God, these lines from the, from the Gospels and from the letters of St. Paul. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible to him who believes. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. The saints also testified to this. The power of faith unlocking the power of God. St. Teresa of Avila, God alone suffices. He who has God lacks nothing. All we need is God. All we need is faith in God. And faith is a grace. It's a gift. So we ask for it. Lord, increase our faith. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. But faith is also free. It's a free act. We have to choose it. St. Therese of Lisieux, at the end of her life, suffered tremendous temptations of doubt. Tremendous darkness. A great darkness, a great depression, a great trial of doubt. And during that time, at one point, she said, I choose to believe. I believe because I choose to. Exercising her freedom. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches this. This is point 166. Faith is a personal act, the free response of the human person to the initiative of God who reveals himself. I'll only believe in God's power and do things counting on it and do things that are daring and perhaps outside of my comfort zone, counting on God's grace if I want to. If I want to be someone who believes, if I choose to believe. The free response of the human person to the initiative of God who reveals himself. Point 180 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Believing is a human act, conscious and free, corresponding to the dignity of the human person. And if we weren't free, if we were forced to believe, it wouldn't correspond to our dignity. It also wouldn't be trust. You can't force someone to trust you. And this is so important. Even if we saw miracles, we would still have to choose to believe what they're pointing to. Miracles are signs or motives for faith. Even St. Thomas, who doubts and says, unless I put my finger in his side, and see the see and touch the marks in his hands. I will not believe. And Jesus shows up and says, Okay, yeah, here, touch the wounds and put your hand to my side. And then Jesus says, And do not be unbelieving, but believe. And then Thomas has to make an act of faith. He says, My Lord and my God. And Jesus says, You believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And so there's still, even for St. Thomas, there's still a distinction between seeing and believing. Thomas has to say, my Lord and my God. He has to believe that what he's seen is a sign or a pointer towards what he believes, namely that Jesus is his Lord and his God, his Savior and God, (laughs) and the Son of God. And so miracles, the miracles of the gospel and other miracles don't force us to believe. There are signs, there are helps, but we still have to freely decide, yes, I believe what this is pointing towards. In the case of the gospels, I believe that the miracles of our Lord are signs that what he says is true. And what is he saying? Well, I am God, I'm the son of God, and I'm the savior. You need a Savior because you're a sinner, and I'm the Savior, and I'm God who's saving you. And there are instances in the Gospels, a very powerful one, in the last chapter of Matthew, of people who who see and don't believe. This is the last chapter of Matthew. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, But some doubted. They saw him. Who? Jesus Christ, who is now resurrected, 
who died on the cross and is now appearing to them resurrected. And some worshipped, which means they believed that he was God. And some doubted, which means they still didn't believe, at least not fully. So Lord, as I pray about faith in your presence, and as I pray about having a life of trust in your help, which will move me to do things that are more daring and to take on things that Perhaps I'm not comfortable doing because I know that they're right or things that make me nervous. Well, help me to help me to use my freedom, Lord. I want to be someone who believes. I want to be someone who trusts in you. And to make it a free act of faith, Lord, I do believe. I do trust in you. And at the same time, because it's grace and God can move our will, we ask him for help. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That passage from Matthew reminds me of the great miracle of the sun at Fatima, the last apparition of Fatima in October of 1917. Our Lady performs this great miracle. And there's tens of thousands of people there. Tens of thousands of people there. And they all pretty much admitted that they saw the same thing that the sun started swirling around in the sky and colors were coming out of it. And then it swooped down towards the people and everyone was totally terrified. They thought it was the end of the world. They thought they were all going to die. And then it returned to its place and eventually it went back to normal. But thousands, thousands of people saw the same thing, something that had no natural explanation. And for many of them, it was a confirmation of their faith. And for, many, and for many of them, it moved them to faith. They were agnostics or doubters before that. But not for everyone. There were many people in that crowd who came in as atheists or agnostics and left still as atheists or agnostics, even though they saw the same sign. They saw the same inexplicable phenomena of the sun dancing in the sky and swooping down towards the earth. Why? Why didn't they believe? Well, the short answer is because they didn't want to. And why didn't they want to? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. Or maybe they're too attached to playing golf on Sunday. They don't want to go. <laughs> they don't want to go to mass. Maybe it's their reputation, right? They were known as a free thinker or Mason, and they worked at a newspaper which pu- which pushed these ideas. And they realized that if they admitted the truth, the faith which that miracle was pointing them towards, well, they would have to change their social status and their friends' circles and everything, and it was too much of a price, too much of a cost. Whatever the case may be, their their faith was not necessitated by the miracle. They had to choose to believe, or they choose not to believe, as the case may be. Lord, what would my life be like if I had a greater trust in you and your power in my life. Forget that despair produced by the realization of your weakness, St. Josemaria writes in the way. True, financially you are a zero, in social standing another zero, and another in virtues, and another in talent. But to the left of those zeros stands Christ. And what an incalculable figure we get. It doesn't matter if I'm weak. It doesn't matter if I'm a zero. It doesn't matter if I have a bad opinion of myself. If I trust in God, well then I can try to do with full confidence and with enthusiasm and with <laughs> and with cheerfulness throwing myself into it. I can try to live the life that God wants me to live, do the things that God wants me to do, and to let him make up let him make up for the difference. Just as the apostles let our Lord make up for the difference between the food that it takes to feed the crowd and the food that they had. And the great news is that God counts on our littleness. He counts on our not being able to do it on our own. This is the sense of that question that he asked Philip. Where can we buy food for all these people? And Philip's like, 
what are you talking about? <laughs> we don't, we're not even close to having the resources to buy food for these people. And Jesus is like, exactly. You can't, but I can. What do you have? He asks in another one of these accounts. Bring to me what you do have. And let's see what I can do with it. And so it's not like Jesus is expecting us to have all sorts of great human talents, all sorts of great human accomplishments before we can get to work with him, before we can do something great as Christians. No, on the contrary, he's expecting us to recognize our littleness, to bring him the little that we have with faith, with confidence, generously, and then to, and then to let him work with it. Let him show us what he can do with our nothingness. And it's precisely the recognition of our nothingness, the recognition of our dependence, that seems to unlock Jesus' power in these situations. And many times in the gospel, this happens in dialogue with our Lord about those things that people need, about their lacks. And so it's when someone recognizes that they are powerless and that Jesus can help them, that Jesus performs miracles, that he, that he unleashes his power on their behalf. This happens with, with the blind man, the blind Bartimaeus. Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, that I may see. He's got no power to see on his own. He's got no ability to see. He's blind. And Jesus says, go. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Your faith has made you well. That the trust that, that your lack could be made up by my power. There's a similar passage where Jesus heals two blind men. And he explicitly asks them the question, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their eyes were opened. And so in these miracles, and in many other miracles like it, there are certain elements that are, that are present. One is the person's inability and the person's precisely lack at their lack of health, their inability to walk, their inability to see. Then there's Jesus's power, his ability to help, his divine power on their behalf. And then the third ingredient, which is what we can do about it, and which is so important, is the admission that they need Jesus' help and the trust that he can do it, that he can help them. And in the spiritual life, in the moral life, something like this is always present. If we're not being self-righteous, if we're not being perfectionists, if we're not fooling ourselves, there's always, there's always an aspect or area of our lives where we are powerless or blind or paralyzed. And in our meeting with Jesus, we can say, Lord, I wish to be healed, or Lord, that I may see. And we do our best to, to, to see and, and to walk and to do whatever, but we're doing it with this great trust in his help that if he doesn't help us, we're not going to make progress. And that's a formula that we have to apply with it, apply to our examination of conscience. What thing, Lord? What one or two things do I need to make an effort in, but with the sense, Lord, that if you don't help me, it's not going anywhere. Okay, I've got I've got uh, five loaves and two fish, but what you're asking me to do is to feed this huge crowd. And so I'll give you the loaves and fish. I'm going to make my effort, but you know it's insufficient, and I know it's insufficient, and you know it's I'm not capable of feeding the crowd, and I know I'm not capable of feeding the crowd. And so if I'm going to feed the crowd, if I'm going to do this thing that you want me to do, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to help me, Lord. To experience what St. Paul experienced. 
My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Okay, St. Paul had that problem. It seems like some sort of moral difficulty that he was going through. He called it a thorn in his flesh, sent by Satan, an angel of Satan, a thorn in his flesh. And he cried out to you, Lord, three times to take it away. He said, who will deliver me from this body of death? And this was the response. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. In what, Lord, do I need to experience that? In what do I need to admit my own insufficiency, but then keep trying with a greater trust and a greater, a greater hope in you? We turn to Our Lady. Our Lady who heard those words of the angel Gabriel and believed them. With God, all things are possible. There's a huge gap between Our Lady's natural powers, her natural abilities, and what God can do with her. It's impossible, naturally, to be a virgin and a mother. But with God, all things are possible. And her trust unlocks that possibility for her. It turns it into an actuality. And our trust will do the same. Lord, there are things in my life that you're asking me to do, but asking me to do more humbly, more generously, with more reckless daring, precisely because I'm relying on you and not on me. Lord, show them to me and help me to get to work. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me. In this meditation, I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.